Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to In Our Own Voice. We're happy to have you here today. Uh, my name is Austin Messick. I am the program manager for NAMI Orange County, um, and I want to welcome, welcome you all here. Uh, today, uh, for our In Our Own Voice, we have Danny Gibbs and John Reynolds. Um, they are two of our volunteers. Uh, Danny also serves as the secretary of our board of directors, so um, you know, happy to have him. Uh, a couple things uh, before we start today, I just want to read off the uh, mission statement for NAMI Orange County. Um, so our mission is to provide emotional support, education, and resources for families and those affected by mental illness. In collaboration with the entire community, we advocate for a life of quality and dignity, one without discrimination for all those persons affected by mental illness. Um, and uh, during this, you know, Danny and John will talk about some sensitive subjects um, that they have, uh, you know, experienced during their lives. Um, so if at any time you feel like you might need uh, emotional support or resource connection uh, here in Orange County, and, you know, whether that be today or sometime in the future, you can reach out to our uh, Orange County Warm Line. It is available 24-7, and that is at 714-991-6412. Again, our Warm Line is 714 714- Nine nine one six four one two. Um, so I will uh, let them take it away, and I believe John, you are going to uh, get us started. So go ahead. Great, thanks, Austin. I appreciate it, Danny. Good seeing you. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Been doing uh, presentations for about 15 years, and I'm really happy to be a volunteer at NAMI. And um, I've learned a lot of things. I'm uh, involved in a couple of uh, other programs with uh, NAMI. Um, currently, I'm a, a peer mentor at a local psychiatric hospital in Santa Ana. Um, I've been in recovery for a long time. There's usually a video that goes along with this presentation, but we're not using it today um, for the element of time, and it's also outdated, by the way. Anyways, um, my story started, uh, I was actually born in London. I came from a family, an oil family. My dad was a civil engineer design oil rigs throughout the world. So I was born in London and uh, moved to New Orleans as a kid and raised uh, in, uh, in Tustin, uh, California, Santa Ana, um, unincorporated. And I um, went to a Catholic, we grew up Catholic, I have six brothers and sisters, went to a Catholic par par uh, parochial school with, and everything seemed fine. Um, there was a little bit of trauma involved in growing up, but. Uh, that's a completely other uh, different story, but it does uh, um, affect um, us in a little way. I think I'm pre pre uh, genetically predisposed to mental illness, along with my uh, chemical dependency. Um, I got into high school, um, started drinking on May 20th or May 28th, 1982. I was 15 years old and I blacked out my first time I drank. Um, when I was a senior in high school, I started smoking marijuana. Um, really enjoyed that, and then um, got to college and uh, continued drinking, smoking weed, and um, uh, started uh, doing other drugs too, no hallucinogenics, but uh, other hard, hard drugs, and then um, my mental illness kicked in basically uh, uh, as a sophomore in college. I was 19 years old, and I flew into a mania, which took uh, religious... Uh, connotations to it and um before i got hospitalized i uh, i have been on the hollywood sign with a friend um the one up in hollywood big letters i was on the third o but i got hospitalized and um lo and behold um, my roommate thought he was the second coming of jesus too and um both of us thought that and since my name's john uh, uh he said well won't you be john the baptist um and um, I said, well, uh, okay. And um, so those are my dark days and full-blown mania, though they weren't dark in the sense that you can't see. I was very, um, very religious, very manic, not sleeping, racing mind, completely delusional. And um, that's where I've been. Uh, and um, I got hospitalized and I'll talk about continuing doing drugs after that. So basically that's my... 30 minute story in five minutes. And um, um, I think that's enough for right now. So I'll give it over to Danny. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. Um, so <clears throat> uh, as I said, as uh, Austin said, my name is Danny Gibbs. 
Um, I have been involved with NAMI since like 2004. Uh, I am trained to do many, many programs uh, through NAMI. Uh, I love it. Uh, I'm also really involved in the art community and creating art. So the art that you're seeing in the screens, that, that is art that I created. Um, and art is a big coping skill for me. It's how I get through all the drama and difficulties or one of the big ones. And I'll get more into that in other topics. But um, yeah, that, uh, right now I have been, for the last 14 years, I've been working for the county healthcare agency and behavioral health services. Uh, 13 of those years I spent uh, as a peer support for youth under the age of 24, um, providing services using my lived experience with mental illness to kind of, to be that for me and to, to, help, to help my clients find recovery. And I loved it. Uh, it's a big part of who I am. And I'm also on the board of directors for NAMI Orange County. So <clears throat> what you have to understand the worst, I've been, I was diagnosed with bipolar at 13 and currently have the diagnosis of schizoaffective. And for me, throughout all my struggles and the hard things I went through, uh, if you were to ask what was the worst part of having to deal with and having a mental illness, and it would have, especially early on for me, is when I was diagnosed, it felt like suddenly I was different, less than uh, set apart from the rest of the community, the rest of the world, that nobody could possibly understand what I went through and that it was definitely a character flaw. It was something wrong with not just me, like I have an illness, but something wrong with my identity. Um, you see, stigma for mental illness is, is very pervasive and it is constantly there. And it convinces us and the world around us that A, mental illness is hopeless and B, there, there, there is something clearly broken about you. And that's my experience for many years. And I still run into it all the time. Uh, people often ask me, you know, like, you don't look like you have mental illness. And, and I love that they're trying to compliment me, but um, it's very stigmatized and difficult. So in uh, fifth grade was a very difficult year for me. Up to that point, it was the worst year I'd experienced. And even though I was very young, I, I, um, I told my parents for the first time that I wanted to die, that I was ready to take my life. And I remember sitting there with my parents and I had a handful of Tylenol pills in my hand and and I remember us crying and my parents telling me that everything was going to be okay and that they were going to send me to a different school and that I was going to be, uh, that I'd be getting better, that things would, 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 uh, would get better than they had been up to that point. I know I didn't believe them and I now know that they really didn't believe them either, but I was sent to a school named Prentice. Prentice is a school for people with learning disabilities. And I don't think that I actually have or had a learning disability. Um, that's debatable. But the school treated me kindly and the, the bullying and the difficulties I'd had before started to evaporate. And in sixth and seventh grade, my parents and I thought for, for the most part that we must have dodged the bull. So eighth grade happens like a force of a tornado. And I was depressed, clinically depressed. And what you have to understand about depression is it's not the same thing. It doesn't feel like sadness. Sadness is an emotion that has benefit, purpose to it. There is no benefit or purpose to depression. It is deep and dark. Uh, and only somebody who's been through it can know how deep and dark that gets. A lot of my early suicide attempts were thwarted because I lacked the energy to pull them through. And then I became manic. So um, mania, for those who don't know, is the opposite. When you have bipolar, it's the opposite of depression. It's not better. It's just the opposite. It's the other end of the, of the pendulum. And it is, to be frank and honest, very enjoyable at times. Lots of energy, less need to sleep. Um, wonderful, uh, powerful beliefs and delusions. Uh, it's incredibly destructive because you take a lot of risks and you don't. And I certainly um, wasn't making the greatest decisions, 
Um, but I had a lot of energy. And so in um, my freshman year of high school, um, I was taking an English course failing miserably at the very end of the, um, of uh, the semester, a teacher assigned a one paragraph assignment worth almost nothing. And I turned in a 42 page epic, um, which is crazy. Uh, but that's the kind of thing. Um, often I couldn't sleep. So I would wake up my dad in the middle of the night, sometime two in the morning, he would give me a very powerful sedative and we would play poker till I fell asleep. Um, this would happen a lot. My dad would have work at four or five in the morning. So it was just, it included everybody was involved, all my family, everybody was somehow involved in the symptoms that I was having. Uh, hospitalization was very, very common for me. Uh, I, whenever I became a danger to myself or others, I was sent to UCLA, which is quite a long drive from Orange County, especially when you're manic and you're not in control of yourself. Um, I began to look at my life as either, uh, you know, being in the hospital waiting to, to be let out or being out of the hospital waiting, waiting for my next episode to send me in. It wasn't a, a way to live my life and it wasn't treatment. Treatment implies something happens that's better, that's healthy, that helps you cope or overcome some of the illness. I was there because I was a danger to myself and others. And that was the best I could hope for when I got that bad that they would send me to this place that for a short period of time that didn't really help me. One incident, and then I will go on, is uh, at the hospital was uh, after a group therapy session, I became manic and I walked across the room to where there was a pool table and I hurled a pool ball at the closest person I, I could see missing them by, I can only guess, inches. Um, I was not angry and I had a very good reason for doing what I did. I don't remember what that reason was, but I believed at that point that I had to do this. I was escorted to a room and um, for hours, they called it a quiet room. And when I came back and saw the, the broken glass on the floor and this terrified eyes looking at me, I realized something. I realized that I, people were scared of me, that they thought I was violent and I'm not a violent person. And to this day, I remember thinking that this is like, a monster jumps into my body, forces me to do horrendous things, and then leaves so I can pick up all the pieces. So those are my dark days. I can't hear you, uh, John. You're muted. I, uh, thank you, Danny. You're very eloquent. Um... I was diagnosed bipolar over the phone, 1986, 19 years old. The doctor, I was put on a, what I like to call heavy metal, which is lithium at the time, which is uh, the third element of the periodical chart. It's the third most common element on planet Earth and the universe. And uh, the metal, the lithium seemed to work, brought me down to Earth, but I thought it was just a salt. Uh, to help me uh, do the P Great Peace March across the United States. It was a supplement for me. But uh, I, got off the, uh, I got off the lithium after my first 10-day stay at the hospital, having been balanced. And I was going down to Mexico on my VW bus I bought and uh, got off at, um, near the power plants at San Onofre State Beach. And my sister left, and um, I ended up surfing and then... Um, as John the Baptist, I baptized two random people on the beach. And I spent the whole night on April 3rd, 1986, crying and begging God to save the world. And I remember um, walking up the railroad tracks past uh, Nixon's house on to San Clemente, my sister picked me up, went back to the hospital. And this time, I, uh, my sister let me out, so I was a I AWOLed, and then Nurse Ratchet came running after me and asked me to come back in the unit. And uh, then I was put on a one-on-one -on -one situation where a nurse follows you around. And uh, that's where I've been. And um, currently, I work in a hospital where people are on one-on-ones and AWOL risk, and um, the table is turned um, 
quite dramatically in that sense. So my psychiatrist never asked me, do you smoke weed, John, or drink? And um, I didn't think I had a problem at the time. So I'd been drinking since 15 on and off and smoking weed since I was 17. And then uh, I went back into college. I dropped off that semester in, up in Los Angeles and uh, continued, uh, started right away smoking weed and drinking and uh, doing other things, no hallucinogenics, just weed and alcohol and um, that white powder stuff that they did in the eighties. Um, anyways, so I, I uh, every day I was smoking weed, drinking, got through uh, college um, a semester late in uh, December of 88. I graduated from college and in January 7th, I went into rehab outpatient. Um, I was only half alcoholic at the time. Um, and I went into 12 step program on January 7th, 1989. And I stopped, I haven't smoked weed since December 23rd, 1988 to this day. Um, I quit smoking weed. That was easy to get off of. And um, the problem was is al alcohol. And um, I do everything alcoholically even to this day um, um, because I'm an alcoholic and uh, it's a progressive disease. But I got sober January 7th, 1989. But that wasn't the stick. I got involved in AA and on August 31st, 1989, with almost eight months of sobriety, I drank against my own will. And at that point, I conceded a man on myself that I was an alcoholic. I didn't get sober the next day. I drank the next day and um, I drank for the next three months. Um, and I'm happy to say that my sobriety date today is December 20th, 1989. And I celebrated 32 years, uh, four months ago. And um, I'm really happy about that. That's taken a lot of work. And, uh, you know, Danny was talking about going in and out of the hospital. I've had the fortune of uh, only been in there twice, back-to-back -back stays. And I haven't been a resident of a hospital in 36 years, but I am a uh, worker in a hospital now. Um, so like I said, my liabilities have become my greatest assets. Spiritual experiences. Um, it took me a long time to, uh, I, uh, my first psychiatrist was Jewish and, um, he, uh, did a great job. He was really thrilled to have Jesus as a patient, you know? And then, um, as the story goes, my second psychiatrist was Dr. Elizabeth, who has now moved to Florida. My third psychiatrist was Zachariah. She retired. So the parents of John the Baptist are Elizabeth and Zachariah. Um, Zachariah being the dad, Elizabeth being the mom. And so a lot of um, weird things happened in my life. And um, it was July 20th, 1990, with exactly eight months of sobriety, I got down on my knees and asked God for help. And he came into my life. And I've been sober ever since, been out of the hospital ever since. And I think something's working right now. So I'm going to keep it going. I'm on a cocktail of two antipsychotics and a mood stabilizer. And I'm not going to, if it works, don't fix it, they say, and I'm not going to work. I'm not going to fix it because it's working. And I'm ever so grateful for that. And um, so being sober 32 years, uh, it's taken a lot of hard work. About 10 years ago, I worked the steps out of the big book for the first time. And I had a really good experience with that. Um, I believe I have a soul sickness and the remedy is spiritual. Um, I have a psychiatric disorder and I believe medicine's the cure for that or the treatment for that. I'm sorry. It's not the cure. It's a treatment for uh, my bipolar disorder. So I know, um, I can speak for Danny just a little bit that, um, it's our faith that's gotten us, um, thus far in our lives. And, um, and, um, I know it's a big part of Danny's story too. So I'll let him share about that, but, um, definitely being an alcoholic, the, for me, it's a spiritual remedy, and um, I have found that. Okay, so acceptance for me. Uh, you have to understand that for me, acceptance uh, was not about whether or not I had an illness. Um, most of my life, I've on some level believed that, that there was something going on wrong, whatever you want to say. But the, the issue was what I wanted to do about it or what I was willing to do about it, right? I mean, I was, in my own mind, hopeless, right? 
um, I, I felt hopeless. I believed I was hopeless. Now, in real life, I had so many blessings. I had a lovely family, caring, loving family, a ho- uh, roof over my head, very comfortable living. And I realized that now. But at the time, I thought I had nothing. And as I mentioned, I had mania, and, and I felt and believed at that time for many years that that was all I had. The only good thing in my, in my world was this, sometimes I get to feel manic and powerful and energized. And then a doctor would come and give me a pill with a ton of side effects and take away the one thing I believed I had, the one thing I, I enjoyed about what I was going through, the one aspect I cared about. And so I was absolutely unwilling to put forth effort to do what I had, what I could to overcome it. And believe me, the best facility treatment help in the world can only go so far if you don't believe, if you don't buy into it and you want to do something about it. So I have a brother, I have two siblings and my sister is three years younger than I am. And my brother is a full 10 years younger than I am. So he's my baby brother, and I love him dearly. He's not quite a baby anymore. He's 30, but uh, he's got a wife and a kid and everything else. But he's still my baby brother, so that's how it is. And he, um, uh, anyway, when I was being hospitalized at UCLA, he was rather young. He was like eight or nine. And um, he uh, would come visit me. It was something I actually looked forward to. And at one particular visit, we were alone in a gym-like setting and we were walking around. And at first he was just telling me normal things that a kid would say. And then at some point he stopped, looked me directly in the eye and he said, Danny, I'm so, I'm so sorry. And I said, what are you sorry for, Ben? And he looked at me with all seriousness and he said, I made you sick. And I remember it hit me like a ton of bricks, like it was... I mean, I just can't even describe how that felt like to to hear. And all I could see in the eyes of my brother was honesty, love, and kindness, compassion, like I'd never seen anywhere else in my life. And that this person loved me so much that he wanted to take the pain that I was experiencing and put it on himself. And so the rest of our time together, what I thought I was doing was helping or trying to convince him that not only was he not the cause of my troubles, but that he was the thing that wanted me to get better. But what I was really doing was convincing myself that things needed to get better. Um, and, uh, you know, see, see, that was the first time I realized that with all these difficulties, it wasn't just about me and my comfort and my illness and my needs. It was about the people I love the most. I didn't know how I was going to do it. I certainly wasn't in recovery at that moment, but I knew in my heart that if there was a way to beat this, if there was a way to overcome this, that I had to do it. So those are my acceptance. Hold on. There we go. All right, guys, back to, thank you, Danny. Back to uh, the acceptance came on the August 31st, 1989, when I drank. Uh, against my own will for the first time. I had drank in more than 50 bars before I was 21. And I had I had drank copious amounts of alcohol. Therefore, I mean, it's only natural that an alcoholic would drink a lot of alcohol. So, um, and I didn't smoke a lot of weed too. So, um, the mental disorder, um, the brain disorder I have is a chemical imbalance that, um, It caused me not to be able to think straight, obviously. And so it was hard to accept the fact that I have bipolar disorder because unlike Danny's depressions, mine usually is the manic side. And um, I do miss the mania, but my mania gets way out of hand, you know, to the point of thinking I'm the second coming or John the Baptist. So but as far as acceptance, uh, acceptance goes, it's on a daily basis. When I take my medicine, um, I don't want to find out what happens when I don't take my medicine. Um, so I take my medicine daily and, uh, it could be that they were really religious, uh, you know, visions and stuff like that. 
but I don't want to take the chance and I will stay um, medicated the rest of my life one day at a time. Treatment is taking my medicine and attending my 12-step um, program and developing my spiritual life. I believe I have a progressive disease that requires progressive recovery. So I'm still, I still have a sponsor. I sponsor people. I, um, I go to meetings still. Um, even after all this time, I know that um, I could relapse, at, you know, if I don't keep my spiritual condition fit and um, stay in touch with the other recovering people. I, I've been around long enough to know that. Um, I know I could have a mental health relapse, which kind of scares me a little bit, but it's possible that I could, um, I've been on the same medicine for about 20 years now and I haven't had any problems. I'm completely stable, completely sober at this moment, um, only by the grace of my higher power and the fact that I take my medicine. Um, I'm a really fortunate guy. So treatment, I would, it's really simple. Meds for the bipolar disorder, and spirituality for my alcoholism, drug dependency. Sorry. Thank you, John. So, um, treatment for me. Sorry, I just gonna go back there. Uh, you guys understand that, as I said, UCLA was not treatment. So uh, I remember now I'm, I'm like 17 or 18 years old and I'm sitting alone in my room and my mother bursts in asking me to pack my suitcase with warm clothing and then leaves before I could ask questions. Uh, the next day I find myself in the family car and we are heading uh, to the airport. I notice we're getting very close to the airport and I ask where we're going. And my mother said that we were going to Topeka, Kansas. Now I lived in Orange County my whole life. So for me, Kansas sounded at least culturally as distant as you could possibly go from Orange County. I'm, it, I, I'm sure most of us at least may have that bias living in California, whether that's true or not. Um, and, and I just, the thought of, of going there uh, especially since I didn't know anybody out there, was terrifying. And I asked why we were doing it. And my mother said that there was this clinic there that she thought could be very helpful to me and, uh, and, and that it was great. And she said that it, but it clarified that it was not a hospital, it was a clinic. As if clinic sounds less threatening than hospital, except she kept saying it over and over again. So by the time we arrived in Kansas City, I was just terrified. And we got into this car and, and it was really late and we drive the hour drive from Kansas City into Topeka where we were going. And it was very late when we got uh, arrived in Topeka. So my parents uh, you know, checked us into a hotel and they went to sleep, but I couldn't sleep. So I woke up my dad and he gave me the powerful sedative and we played poker. And this was a very, very interesting game of poker. You see, we never said a word to each other the whole time. And we had no evidence to believe that this could possibly be true. But somehow we simultaneously knew that this would be the last poker game I would ever need to play with my old man in order to fall asleep. That something was going to happen better. That was something was going to prove that the worst of my illness at the very least was behind us. And it was like a very special moment. So the next day we get up and what I find is that Topeka is actually, Kansas is actually not flat like many areas of Kansas are. Uh, no, it was beautiful rolling hills. And we get to the, um, to the highest area of the entire city and we walk into a big building and you can see the tower building right there in the picture. And um, I open up the door, walk through it, locks go off behind me. My mother is, it's a clinic, not a hospital the whole way. And some person in a white coat shook my hand and said, welcome to Menninger's Hospital. And there I was. Um, 
the average stay at the residential unit at Minningers where I was, was six months. I was there two years and I don't regret a single moment of it. You see, um, it was very restrictive as you'd expect at first, but gradually I not only earned freedoms and the ability to do things, but I earned stages of my recovery and I could do it at my own pace. All too often with mental illness, um, things are rushed. There's not a lot of beds in the psych unit. There's not a lot of hours for a psychiatrist. It's, it's, it's based on the provider's timetable, not the person who's actually given the treatment. At Minninger's, I didn't have to rush. I could go at my own pace, in my own way, and I was treated like an individual. Two people with the same diagnosis are going to experience that diagnosis in very different ways. And Minninger's accepted that, believed that, and, 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 and you know, was able to just get to know me and build their trust and rapport with me, rather than making assumptions. Uh, most of what in the past the UCLA had been wrong. Uh, I, I gained all kinds of, uh, I gained a job, I graduated from high school, I inserted myself into a community that had almost no stigma, because people had been coming in and out of Minningers that whole time, and, and, uh, and it wasn't a big deal, nobody cared about mental illness, or whether you had it or not, um, and I, I just, I, I became part of a community that was so wonderful. So wonderful, in fact, that after discharge, I stayed another five years in the state because I love Kansas. And I recently actually went back. I spent a week, two weeks ago, I spent a week back in Kansas being around my Kansas family because I have two families, California, Kansas, and being around people who I love. And it's where I accepted Christ and how I became a Christian. That was that happened in Kansas, and there's a number of reasons I won't. We don't have time to go into, but the the experiences of being part of a community, of accepting help from a creator that is benevolent and loves me and loves me regardless of what I've done or how many times I fall, and that is the treatment I experienced there, and I'm very grateful for it. I joke a little bit. Oh, thanks, Danny. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, I, I, uh, I mirror your experience uh, finding a higher power. Definitely. It's really helped my recovery uh, tremendously. I, I wouldn't be sitting here without that. I wouldn't be speaking here. I joke about coping skills because I've, uh, when I was 17, I started doing Copenhagen and I've been on and off Copenhagen for the last 40 years. Um, but that's an unhealthy coping skill. Healthy coping skills for me is playing tennis, reading books, working, spending time with family, um, praying a lot, and going to church. Those are coping skills for me. So the main three coping skills I have are to work 40 hours a week, Continue going to meetings, staying in touch with my sponsor. Did I say three? Um, more than three. Um, yeah, those are, are these your pictures, Danny? Oh, you're on mute. There. Yeah, yes, I oh, did. Oh, even the art, all the art on these slides are yours? Yes. Oh, okay, cool. And the art, did you do the art behind you? Uh-huh. Oh, that's amazing, man. Oh, <laughs> that's incredible. You. Anyways, uh, coping skills are pretty simple. Uh, breathing, going to work, eating, exercising a little bit. Um, of course, uh, praying um, and having a higher power and um, the relationships I've built since I've been in recovery. Okay. So coping skills for me, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on it. It, it is uh, I've been asked many times, like two years seems like a lot of time. What did you do? And there's so many things I did, but coping skills was certainly a part of that. And I'm always developing them too. And so, yes, the art that, that I show you, I, I, I still do it. I still try to practice art as much as I can. Um, I feel better when I do. And 
you know, it, it's kind of, I was an art major. It didn't happen for me. It doesn't, didn't really work out for me, but um, just being able to create just for the purpose of creating, not for the purpose necessarily of an end product, just the, the journey that brings somebody to that. Uh, I, I consider myself part of the art community in the mental health community in Orange County only because I relate to our other artists and um, NAMI before the pandemic and hopefully one day again we'll have an art, uh, you know, an art um, art council uh, that would uh, where we would show our work and galleries and stuff and I've always been honored to do that. Um, honesty. So honesty uh, encompasses many of my uh, coping skills. I tend to want to isolate when I am not doing well. I don't like naturally like admitting that I'm struggling. That's something I have to deal with. So when I feel the uh, pressure or the, the, the desire to hide anything from those I really care about, my family, people who are close to me, my therapist, that actually means to me that I need to share that something's going on and I need to find somebody and tell them what's going on and work through it. And that's a big one. I mentioned God and becoming a Christian there um, in the last uh, topic. And yes, there will never be a more important coping skill, but there will also never be a more important intervention or aspect to my identity. Everything that I am revolves around my belief and faith in Jesus Christ. And I, and this is, People have come to different perceptions. I'm only telling my own story, but I, I'm passionate about it. And I am so blessed that I have that in my life. You see, it's natural for somebody in recovery to say that my identity doesn't exist in my illness. That, that's not my identity. That's not who I am. But that's hard to do because the illness I happen to have affects the brain. It affects the neurons and the synapses and the firings of neurotransmitters back in the brain. And what can, and, and that affects everything, my behavior, my perspective on things, the, my belief system, delusions are part of my symptoms and all these things. What, what hope could I ever have of, of, of overcoming that and even more importantly, transcending that um, in my life? And I have found that, that giving it over to God and uh, trusting in God is it because maybe my identity isn't really in my brain at all? Maybe my identity is in my soul and who I am and who God made me to be. So those are my coping skills. Okay. Wow. Last segment. I uh, I can't believe where I'm at right now. Um, the tables is turned. I'm a candidate for permanent hospitalization, and now I um, serve as a counselor type person in a um, lockdown psychiatric ward. How do I get there from there to here? Is a miracle. Um, I really respect Danny's uh, faith and. Um, it, it, it resonates with me. My faith has got me this far. My compliance with medication, my determination in growing spiritually to deal with my alcoholism is a big success. I did get married 15 years ago. I have a stepdaughter who's now 24, graduated from college. And um, I help out a lot of people that I don't even know. And um, it's all because I have grace in my life and I accept it. And um, I try to help out as many people as I can. And that's just who uh, my higher powers made me. God's made me that way. So I'm really blessed. Danny's blessed. We're all blessed to be here in whatever capacity we're in right now. So um there's help out there. There's tons of programs, MHSA programs. There's a lot of help out there if you are seeking help. Um, I'll just mention two of them is the warm line through NAMI. And then OC Links has therapists that answer the phone that can connect you with other 
resources in the community to help a loved one or yourself with the diagnosis. Okay. So when we get to this, the topic of success, hopes, and dreams, uh, you, you know, I, I would forgive you to think that my success, hopes, and dreams happened in Kansas. And in, in, indeed, my, re, my journey in recovery began in Kansas. But after seven years in the state, uh, five of which I was uh, after being discharged from Minningers, um, I knew in my heart, and I prayed a lot about this, and I thought about it, and I knew in my heart that I that it was uh, that I would eventually have to come back to California. That's where I belong. That's where my family is. That's what's the goal. And sometimes be having goal being goal oriented is important. And um, so I did. So I uh, my my dad and my brother took a one way plane trip to Kansas. We hitched a big trailer hitch to my Ford Explorer because I have too much stuff, and we drove to California. And we had a great time. We, we did national parks. We did Vegas. We had an amazing time. But it wasn't like reality. Uh, it was a vacation. Reality hit in, set in when we arrived in Orange County. And when you have a disability like severe mental illness, um, moving that distant is really, really tough. It's really stressful. Everything starts over. You, you don't. I didn't really have any friends anymore. I had to have new providers, new therapists, new psychiatrists. Even the medications that I take um, have different rules about them because there's safety things, and I had to learn that. So many things that was happening, and then my mother trying to, you know, my parents both trying to, you know, to Danny, you got to get a job, and all those things. And uh, I decided to kind of deal with the stress that I would show up unannounced at my old junior high apprentice that had been at least for two years, very helpful for me and see what happens. And so I did, I showed up on the door and a teacher who I had back then who was very compassionate as a teacher and her name is <laughs> Mrs. Lerner of all things. Uh, she, um, she's now the principal of the school. And she invites me into her office. We talk. We have a great time talking about the stories, what had happened since we'd seen each other last. And then she offered me a job as an instructional assistant, as somebody who would mentor and guide and help the students as they, you know, went through the day. And I, I wanted to say yes, but I said no. And I said no because I didn't get it. I didn't think I could do these things. I didn't think... It was even appropriate necessarily for me to be on kids. And so uh, I left kind of feeling worse off than I did when I got there. And before, and I walked away from the school and headed to my car and my phone rang and I answered it and it was my mom. And she said, Danny, did you get a job yet? And I said, yes. And I ran back in there and I, I took the job. And that was the beginning of everything that was going to follow. You see, with this job, I realized something that I had this real amazing tool, this gift that God gave me, which is lived experience. That I could talk to these kids and go, well, well there are definitely differences and we are unique as individuals, but let's focus on commonalities too. And what I did to get through some of these difficulties. And we worked together and I bonded with them and I helped them and I helped them see hope and stuff like that and and through that after that i started getting involved with nami and speaking and doing panels and eventually i was hired by the healthcare agency and behavioral health services and now i'm um, in the administrative office of the mental health services act um, giving my peer perspective on all kinds of things and being involved in the system and improving it and it's all wonderful uh, these are my successes my hopes is that i I continue to uh, to grow in my faith and my belief, and and that I uh, grow into uh, even m you know more experienced, uh, humbled man, and I'm very grateful for that. But what I do realize, and then I'll, I'll go to questions, is I'm not cured. There is no cure for mental illness that I've seen, and uh, there's no reason for me to think that I will be cured in my lifetime, that, that there will be a cure in my lifetime. And I have to be very real about the fact that I could relapse any day, 
it could all be over. I could be back in a hospital tomorrow. And my natural inclination is, is what was the point? Why did I go through everything that was so difficult if tomorrow I could be back at some kind of unit? And what I say to myself and what I tell all of you now is I have something better than a hope and better than a cure. I have hope. I believe that God will guide me through everything that comes my way and that if it doesn't kill me, it'll make me stronger as a human being as a, and as a person and be able to relate more to the people that I help and support and walk alongside. So thank you everybody for um, hearing John and I out. We love doing this. I, I, I don't think I've presented this presentation with anybody more than John, and it is a gift for us to do this together. Mm. So I would like to start to uh, ask you guys for questions either for both of us or either one. Um, we have like 15 minutes, so I, I ask that you keep it somewhat short in, so that everybody can get a question in. You can either, uh, you can chat the questions in um and or uh austin do you want to say something sure so i i know we have a, a question from the chat that can kind of get us started um but yes i think the the best way actually would do to do the q a at the bottom of your screen um sometimes the chat can get a bit lost so I do ask you to use the the q a you'll see it down there uh, at the bottom of your screen if you would like um, to have a chance to speak um, where we could uh, hear you and, and likely see you as well. Um, you can raise your hand. Um, I believe that uh, that hand raise function is down there on the bottom of your screen as well. Um, so if you, uh, you know, raise your hand, um, I can uh, allow you to talk um, as well. So Before um, we do that, can I answer some of the chats here? Um, how to get, how do you get someone with mental illness to actually go to get help? He says his depression is situational, but he's been depressed for 10 years. He's also an artist, 32 years old. Well, mental illness is a marathon, not a sprint. And we realize and accept our needs and accept what's going on in the pace that that is with us. So um, a couple things is uh, be honest and loving. Um, you know, um, the, realize that sometimes people need to, uh, to believe that it is situational, that it is not something permanent. Uh, and, and it's not just because we're trying to be negative, it's because we're sometimes we're only capable of, of believing so much. And so I would say be kind and, and consider your own health. Um, you know, sacrificial love is a beautiful thing in mental illness. When you're trying to support someone with mental illness, it doesn't always work. Sometimes you need to have a reserve of energy and motivation, and you have to keep track of your own health. Uh, also, just because he, do, he may not seem to be listening or taking it in, if you give him with love uh, advice and tell him how much you want things to be better, who knows the, so the seeds that might be planted? John, did you want to mention anything? Yeah. NAMI has, of course, uh, family to family. Um, that's important for family members to take, to take care of yourself um, and understand what people are dealing with when they uh, have a mental illness. Um, and it, it helps you uh, cope with uh, having a loved one that... Um, may be suffering from a mental health condition, family to family. And uh, uh, the other course is peer to peer uh, for peers taught by two peer people uh, in a, a class or they're online and they might be coming live now, but they're a great class to understand the different types of mental illness and how to cope and be and live with a mental health uh, challenge. Okay. Austin, is there anybody who would like to, to, to say something verbally? Uh, right now, let's see. I don't see any hands raised right now, but I know we got another question, uh, which was, how did, uh, how did each of you deal with the stigma from other people or sometimes uh, uh, stigma from yourself, so self-stigma? 
Well, self stigma for most, for many years is probably the worst aspect for me personally. Um, I certainly believed and, and accepted that there was some shame around the illness. So um, that didn't help with my motivation to want to get better. That made things worse. Um, and um, it, it made me want to crawl deeper inside myself and isolate. And that's the worst thing I can do uh, with my illness is isolate. So uh, it, it took a long time to feel, although I'll tell you, when you tell your own story, and I can remember the first time I told my own story with NAMI, and this is a long time ago, this is like just under 20 years ago, um, I felt stronger and more confident in myself and my, uh, you know, and, and was able to kind of go, yes, there is, mental, there is stigma and it's out there and it's bad, but, um, you know, there are bigger things. And maybe by telling my story and not allowing it to, to make me feel shame, then maybe I can help somebody else and change some minds with that. Uh, the worst thing about stigma was for my family and what they had to go through. And even stigma that providers like therapists and psychiatrists, when I was young, um, it, they weren't free of it either. And they once, one doctor was disagreeing with my mother on some aspect of my treatment. And the doctor said to my mom, well, the apple doesn't really fall far from the tree, does it? Which pisses me off to no end, um, uh, excuse me, but that's true. And so uh, they had to deal with a lot. And I'm so grateful they took family to family that John mentioned, they were able to come through that and not feel shame either. Hey, uh uh, Danny, real quick, there's a question on here uh, that I'd like you to answer. Um, sure. My son is currently in an IMD, which is an Institute for Mental Disease. Uh, he seemed very depressed about he seems very depressed about his circumstances. What can I do to help him have hope for his future? Yeah, a lot of what I said with that other person about it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, so. Yeah, space. Uh, depression saps the energy that we have. When you're depressed, just getting up and getting food or whatever it is, is can be a huge chore. You have no energy. You're just down. Um, you know, it can seem like and that can go on for long periods of time. So uh, be aware of that and be aware of the difficulties he has. Um, and also be aware that uh, I always say give, you know, resources. So if you have resources or activities or good things, uh, I say make those available to, to him, but make sure he knows. And you really, really have to say this. You have to convince him that you aren't pressuring. You're not saying you have to do these things, but they're great. And one of these things is the wellness center. There are three in Orange County. One's in Garden Grove, one's in Orange, and one's in uh, uh, South County. Uh, I can't remember the city, but anyway. Lake um, Forest. Lake Forest, thank you. And these are free resources for people with mental illness, but there's no treatment. There's no talk of meds. There's no, none of that. It is purely fun, art, cooking, hanging out with good people in a safe environment, um, letting them know about this resource. And, and he may say a hundred times, no, don't want to do it. No, don't want to do it. And if you are kind, compassionate, and loving, maybe one day he'll break down and say, okay, I'll give it a shot. And he goes to the wellness center and he finds a community of people who care for him and aren't stigmatize and and can help him in his recovery and everything that's the recovery model the medical model says we need therapy we need medications and we do but the recovery model which is the more important model says we need quality of life something to get up uh, in the morning to do and a place to call their own and the wellness center provides that there are other things and other good things that you can do but again realize 
the difficulty that your son is having, the, the, the truly sappy nature of energy, sappy nature of depression and, uh, and all that and, uh, and the love that you can give him, the love and patience, you know? And as I said with the last person, telling somebody with mental illness that you love them and you care for them Sometimes they're not going to reciprocate. They're not going to act as if they hear you or, or acknowledge you when you say it. But when my parents did that to me and I wasn't capable of going, thank you, I love you too. I remember that stuff. And when I decided to try to get into recovery later on, that was the thing I cling to. And that's what helped me get through it. Good question though. Anybody Dan, else? You want, Dan, you want to cover uh, Steve's uh, question about peers and peer certification expansion, or do we want to postpone that? Sure, for now? sure. where is that? Is that in the chat? Yeah, it's the last one. Oh, so, yeah. I don't have that one. Uh, okay. Hold on. Uh, if we're talking about peer certification, um, this is really important. Uh, it's gotten better, but the I'm a peer. That's my job. That's what I do for a living is I'm a peer. I use my lived experience to inform what I do in helping others and now in an administration with the Mental Health Services Act. So peers are really, really an important aspect of it. They are also a unique resource. They're not the same as a therapist or an MFT or a social worker. Well, sure, all of those guys are great. Peers rely on something that only peers have which is their own experiences. And a peer can be somebody with mental illness and a peer can be a family member, but they rely on what they've been through and the wisdom they've gained by being going through it. Um, and so it's hit or miss with whether programs and providers value or support the idea of peers, or even if they're offered in, in various things, we, we don't have the validation that other forms of treatment have. And I would argue that there's peers are just as important as any other thing you can get, including therapy and psychiatry. So, um, so it was some time ago that it was passed a CIRF certification process, which means in December of 2023, I mean, I apologize, next December, 2022, uh, we are going to have certification for peers. And in the world of healthcare, certification is really important. It validates, it gives uh, authority and, and uh, structure to what we do. And we, you know, the, especially as it gets closer, we're gonna really start to try to make this as recovery oriented as possible. Um, so write, you know, uh, the, soup, the Board of Supervisors for Orange County, talk to people, get involved. Make sure that this is done in a recovery way, not a way that's exclusive, but includes everybody's different backgrounds and what they can give. Um, it's, it's a good thing, but it can be done wrong. If it's an exclusive thing that just takes people who are really valuable peers and removes them, that's not good either. So we need to have a really, we need to have peers involved. I know there are some people here from the office that I work at who are a big going to be a big part of that and that's something that we really care about and validating that that aspect i'd like to say uh in the short time we have left i appreciate everybody who came here tonight to spend an hour with danny and i in austin mm -hmm. we hope that our stories uh inspire you to know that people can recover from severe mental disorder and or substance abuse and it's possible um there's a lot of love to give danny and i have a lot of love to give um, because our liabilities have become our greatest assets and we're here to share it with people in any way we can as long as we keep our health in check um i appreciate i gotta pick my mom from uh, coast mace right now in about 30 seconds so danny i don't know if uh, you're going to continue but i have to run right now um bless you guys and thanks for having me thanks good to see you john thanks for presenting with me okay see you guys
Thank you so much, John. I appreciate you being here. And Danny, thank you as well. Mm -hmm. um, this has been a great presentation and I, I really loved everything you guys had to offer. So um, this has been terrific. One last thing before everybody goes, I'm going to, um, oh, sorry about that. I am going to paste a link into the chat. Um, it is a, a survey. Um, if you could please fill out this survey um, tonight, we'd really appreciate it. Um, these surveys are, they go to our funders and they do help us to continue providing these programs um, at no cost to the community. So it's a, a huge thing um, that's really important to us. So if you could please fill that out tonight, we'd appreciate it. Um, I will also send this along in an email uh, following this um, with the recording. And uh, that recording should be available by uh, about five o'clock tomorrow. So. Um, once again, thank you all for being here. Um, Danny, appreciate it. Also loved you sharing your art. Um, and uh, we hope to see you all back. We're going to have quite a few uh, programs over the next uh, couple months, um, particularly in May. May is Mental Health Awareness Month, so you can look out for a lot more programs from us in the future. So um, once again, we're signing off. Y'all take care and uh, be well. Bye-bye now. Bye.